Well, thank you. Um, again, this is the uh, another iteration in the in data format evolution. It says, um, let's be a little, hopefully, background on myself here. I'm uh, I'm Claude Warren. Uh, so I'll tell you who's doing this. I'm Claude Warren. Uh, I am not the one found in Wikipedia. Uh, I'm a, an Apache Foundation member, Jenna PMC member for a number of years now. Uh, software engineer, developer. I used to be a project manager and I used to be a systems engineer. Um, backed away from those, if that's not my forte. I am a mad scientist, I'll put that out there, uh, and a musician. And the project I'm going to talk about today um, was developed at IBM and then later at, at WePro. So uh, not just myself, but a, a number of, of people were involved. Um, now I did promise a history of um, XML and RDF, and so this is my history slide. <laughs> um, so well, back in ancient times, 1960s, there was the ARPANET, and in, by the 80s you have, we have SGML, which is sort of a form of XML. So XML has a very early pedigree, if you will. 1990s, we get the modern internet. Um, 95, with JavaScript is introduced, um, and we have anybody who worked in 95 would remember the, the browser wars and that you really couldn't write JavaScript that went across all of the browsers that were in use. It made it almost impossible to do anything with it reasonable. Um, in 97, the RDF is first published. Um, and then amazingly, it took all the way until 98 for XML to actually be published. Um, and at this point, we're using XML for X RPC type calls and, and those sorts of things across the network. Uh, and then we have at the millennium uh, a watershed moment because we get SOAP, which codifies the, the XML transports. Um, we have REST being defined at that point. Um, JSON is first specified. So there's a, a lot of things happen right at the, the turn of the millennium. And then obviously we move forward. You get Firefox is introduced in 2004, the same year that the RDF specification is published. Uh, and then it takes all the way until 2005 for, for AJAX to be described um, and, and defined. And it's using XML or JSON and JavaScript and asynchronous communications, great stuff. Um, so really starting in 2005, we start to see some action, some movement on the, uh, really being able to do things on the client side. 2008, the Chrome browser comes out. 2009, we finally get an agreement on how JavaScript is going to work across all of the browsers. And from about that point on, you can start to, to write code that really will transfer across uh, multiple browsers. So you'd be able to write the code once and, and have it work. And then uh, took all the way until 2013 for JSON to become standardized. So uh, what we see here is that this early on we're, we're playing in XML and then we're, we start to see transitions to JSON uh, more when you're dealing with um, interactive, you know, user base facing uh, applications on the, on the browser, uh, some XML there, but uh, that seems to have migrated significantly over to, to JSON. And uh, so then in 2017, which is when this project starts, we have JavaScript on the client side, um, as the, as the programming language, uh, usually implementing the AJAX protocols. Um, JSON is the common format to exchange uh, between these and they're generally REST based applications. Uh, but XML is still there. It's still, it's used um, in between, in service calls between, uh, between services in large organizations, uh, using, um, often using the, the SOAP based protocols for that. Although also uh, available in, in uh, in other formats in the, in the web services. Um, my opinion of both of these is that they have a difficulty uh, expressing complex relationships between items in, in a data forest. So if you, if you have a simple tree, it's not so bad, but if you wanna describe things that, that occur multiple times, 
you know, XML gives you the ability to, to cite a reference within the document. Um, I'm not sure what, what JSON does. I suspect there's something similar. Um, but it's a little more, a little more complex um, to express the forest in, the, in these two uh, systems. So at this point, um, our story begins. In 2017, we, we begin looking at this project. So the question now is, you know, what is this project? Um, we're going to do device configuration management. Uh, and initially this meant we were looking at uh, devices that support networks. So you're the routers, the, you know, all of the, the, those components that you see in an internet, in a internet network. Um, and the customers were primarily big telco. So they have very you know, restricted systems and the, you know, they're firewalled off, um, very large systems. And we're basically, we're just going to configure, we're gonna manage the configurations of those devices. Uh, now later this changes and becomes, um, we're gonna start looking at, you know, smart meters and, and other things that, that form networks uh, and have configurations and the definition of configuration changed over time. Um, but effectively what we're going to talk about is, is configuration management of devices in a network. Okay. And the second piece we did was we decided to design with an open world assumption. And um, I have found that as soon as you think you know everything about the environment, um, somebody will come along and tell you something you didn't know. And that if you work with closed world assumptions, uh, you will end up writing yourself into a corner and having to do a lot of work. But if you start with open world assumptions where you say, you know, we don't know everything, and we need to be able to adapt easily and quickly, then your projects are, are um, my experience is the projects are more likely to succeed. Uh, in our case, we recognized that the users of the system would want to be able to uh, add information to the system or, or annotate the objects in the system in some way. Um, there's things that are part of the company that we're, you know, we're going to deploy this in that where they were gonna to wanna to be able to identify the devices they're talking to in specific ways. Uh, and that we don't know what those are when we're starting this project. We also recognize that when we pull the data and we, we start to get our data together, subsequent processing is going to enhance that data. And we're gonna to wanna to be able to track that. And for some cases, we don't know what, what that is in some of the cases as well. The third part of it is the application driven device discovery. Uh, when we go out to interrogate a device, uh, when we started, it, it was really simple. I mean, we were gonna open an SSH session, right? And talk to the device and get its configuration. But when we start looking at other applications, other applications of the product, you wanna talk to uh, smart meters, then you're gonna be talking MQTT. So you're gonna be, you know, have front end pieces that you talk to that you're gonna use to get device discovery. So there's a lot of information about how you talk to these things that we don't know at the beginning. Uh, and then finally, it is uh, probable that the information we pull off a device will identify that device in some other data set. And we're going to want to be able to pull that data into the system and be able to use it uh, to, to answer questions by the users. So, we decided to use RDF graphs as our data storage technology. Um, okay. And so what we end up with then is a, uh, a system that looks like this. We've got the, the user uh, as represented by the smiley face. We've got devices as represented by the boxes there, the orange boxes. We've got the firewalls, a nice red line. And then our solution is going to be, we're going to have a service network it's obviously powered by Apache. Uh, we're going to use that. We're going to use Kafka to cross the firewall. Um, we're going to talk to another component inside the firewall, and that component will use Apache Mina to talk SSH to the devices, and then uh, we'll pull the data back. We'll store whatever information it needs in terms of the graph data in a Fuseki storage on inside the firewall, might have a little bit of blob storage inside the firewall to, to store you know, uh, configurations and things like that so it can make comparisons with, with later configurations. 
in the end, it's going to put the data back on Kafka and send it back across to the service network. We're going to do more processing in that network. We'll, we'll stream it through. We'll put it into, we'll put the information, the, the graph information into Fuseki and the blob information, the, uh, the configuration files and things like that into blob storage. So that's the general idea of, of what this application is going to do. Uh, so why did we do it this way? Well, one is what I've been trying to say is the future is a vast and undiscovered country. Um, you know, there, there are many things that, that relate to this. We don't, there's no way we're going to know what the users are going to want to do with the application. Um, there are similar phrases in, in, in modern culture. You get, you know, you can't make anything idiot proof because idiots are so ingenious. Statements like that. You really cannot tell what's going to happen. Uh, how your application is going to be used in the future. So we, we recognize that at the beginning. Um, we're dealing with network devices and thus a network data model just fits the domain. So in our case, the, um, you know, we picked RDF because it was a, a network data model. The other piece of this is that RDF uh, in RDF, all the properties are first-class citizens, so you don't have a distinction between a property and an edge like you do in some other graph uh, models, uh, modeling systems. And I, I sort of relate this back to uh, to XML. You know, in XML, you have uh, child nodes and you have uh, the uh, properties of, of elements. Uh, and you know, if if you start a process and you think, oh, you know. Um, perhaps a phone number is a property of a, of a person, then down the road, you realize that you need to have more phones and then there are different types of phones. And all of a sudden, the phone number is no longer really a property. It really needs to have its own sub you know, child element and you need to have lots of more properties of that element. And if you try then later to make that change, all of your XPath queries have to change because of this distinction. Uh, what RDF forced us to do was to, you know, get rid of that distinction and say, okay, everything can be an object and, and let's, you know, allow us to move in that direction if that's what we need to do. Um, okay. Um, the other piece that it gives us is that all of the properties are namespaced. So we're not going to have name conflicts. If we want to call something in the system a name, you know, give it a property, a name, and the user wants to, in their data that they're adding to the system, wants to call something name, those will be in two different namespaces, or they can be in two different namespaces. And so there, there's not going to be a conflict there. Uh, we don't have to worry about, about that kind of conflict coming from user data or other data coming in or um, you know, changing the data later, um, or you know, other properties coming into the system. Um, there's also a, a standard query language. So Sparkle is our standard query language. We get this in the graph. It's, it's a very simple language in, in a lot of respects. If you know uh, SQL, Sparkle is very easy to pick up. Um, so that helped us in, in you know, making the case that we should go in this direction. Um, there's a lot of RDF libraries available out there. I was actually, when I went to look, I was rather surprised. Um, I knew that uh, you know, Jenna obviously for Java uh, and a number of others now. Uh, JavaScript has a library, Python has a library, Perl, and there are many more libraries uh, that'll that'll read and write the RDF graph or talk Sparkle to you know, to a Sparkle endpoint, so that the accessibility of the data um, is there. It's not as as restricted as as uh, you might think at first. Okay, so. The first thing we have to do is we have to be able to accept input from users. So, um, you know, if you think about the traditional data coming from uh, a web, it coming into a web service, it comes in in, in um, a web form, so it's a name value pairs effectively. Um, you, can, you can get J, uh, XML documents, you can get JSON documents. Uh, and on top of that, we're going to support all the RDF formats that are supported by Jenna. So serialization of RDF graph. So that's the, the one at the bottom, obviously, is the easy one. The other three, what we ended up doing was we took those and used Apache Commons configuration 
to read those types of data. So web form, that's name value pair, that becomes, that's a standard, you know, common um, configuration reading property files effectively. Uh, XML, there's an XML version to, of, you know, to read XML for commons configuration and JSON the same. Um, and then in the end, we can take that and then write a very simple conversion from Apache commons configuration into an RDF format that we can then feed into the system. Um, so <clears throat> the next part is we're then going to pass the RDF between uh, between services within the system. So once we put it into RDF, we leave it that way and, and we pass it throughout. Um, so when we're putting it on the, the Kafka queue, it's RDF, it's a serialized RDF. When it's coming off, you know, obviously in the, traverse the firewall and we read it, process it. Uh, everything um, is, is done in RDF in terms of, of you know, metadata, if you will. Um, obviously the configuration files are a specific object and we're uh, we don't encode those into RDF. We, we could. You can, there are steps in our process to do some of that. But in general, um, the, the data that's flowing through the system is in RDF. We used a, uh, a beans on RDF framework, or we, we actually wrote one here, similar to um, PA for RDF, a persistent sanitation for RDF, which was a package I wrote a couple of years ago. Uh, and this allows us to to use RDF elements in Java in a, in a very easy manner. Uh, and as an example here, um, I have this triple at the top. Um, it's a UN6LN2971, which happens to be my ID on Slack, I think. Um, has the name Claude, okay, it's a simple triple. Uh, if we think about this in terms of Java, we can say, well, there's an instance of something and um, that thing has a method then which has the value. So um, the instance and the method is going to provide, you know, get name and the value will be Claude. And then down below here, I've got the, an example of what that might look like. You have a resource, we have a, a static property called name, so we can do that easily. And then the method get name simply gets the name value from the resource and returns that. And that's fairly simple. Now I can take any element, any object, or I'm sorry, any subject in the triples in the data store and say, oh, that's a person. And then I can make calls on it. I can get the name. I can, you know, whatever other uh, methods I add for person uh, we can do. And um, so it makes it very easy for Java developers then to say, okay, well, I've got a device that I'm going to talk to. So I, you know, what are the properties of a device, and get those uh, out of the out of the RDF graph um, into local storage, you know, into local locally, and then you're able to access all of those components uh, fairly simply. And the advantage here again is that now all those other things that get added later are still attached, even though you don't have direct access through the person class. You, you could still get them by going through the resource and getting them. So if you knew that something was there on a person, um, you know, you could, you could go ahead and grab it from the, the person object anyway, if you just have access to the resource. Um, okay, and then also there's a, a query builder library, which gives us the ability in Jenna to construct query templates. So sort of like um, uh, the, named queries in uh, SQL, we can do this uh, similar thing. So we can build a standard query and say, okay, we're gonna replace these parameters, uh, execute the query at the time. So it makes, you know, we can do a lot of the same things you can do in SQL uh, in terms of, of setting it up to make it easy to, to process requests. Uh, let's see, we're going to use Fuseki on uh, on TD, as I've noted on the graph, when we're using TDB as our storage system, so the standard uh, Jenna comp uh, components. Uh, and we are going to enhance the data as it passes through the system. This is sort of what we expect to do. This is why we started this in the first place, uh, realizing that we didn't know everything. So data comes in, we're going to we're going to enhance it uh, as it passes through. So as it goes to the, um, the agent, the agent might add to the data, saying uh, to the event, 
you, know, you get an event comes in on the front end, it's a timestamp on that, passes it off to the the agent. The agent might say, "Well, this agent processed this event, and we can add that data to the event pieces." You're going to be able to go out and and hit the device and get information from the device and, and enhance the you know the idea of what the device is. Pass that through the system. Um, subsequent processes can then look at the, that data and add uh, more data to the to the description of the event as it goes along through the system. Okay, so now the question is that I always get asked when I presented this is, you know, what about the UI? I, we haven't spoken about the UI here. We've got this front end and we're processing the data through as, as I just described, but we haven't spoken at all about the UI. So what we've done though is we've provided the microservices so we can access the graph, we can access objects like a, a device, an event, uh, as, as you can pull them out of the graph as Java objects, serialize them out and do whatever you want to do with you know, device and event and other objects like that. We have a series of microservices that will return um, the data from the graph as uh, you know, text plane, uh, as XML, application XML, as uh, JSON, or as any of the Jenna supported RDF serialization formats. So we can pull data back out. We also gave direct query to the, to the uh, graph so that users could then uh, access the, the data that's in the graph and ask the questions um, that we didn't really arrange for in the front end. Because you know, we, when you build the, the services and then when you build the, the UI, on when somebody builds the UI on top of that, you're making assumptions about what the user wants to know. And if there's anything that you haven't accounted for, and there's a lot of work to go around and, and you know, re-implement parts of that to get that data up to the front end where it can then be seen by the UI that, that's being implemented and, um, and presented to the user. So we provided this direct query to the Jenna the Fuseki graph so that you could make queries that we hadn't anticipated. Um, and the other reason that we didn't actually build a UI was that we expected that the tool would be integrated into uh, existing systems. So you would have a, a framework that uh, Telco would put together and they would just want to be able to query and, to, and get data and they want it to look and feel like their component. So we didn't spend a lot of time working on the UI. We did use uh, a tool that gave us the ability to define the APIs and then quickly um, present that as a, a simple web-based uh, interface. But that's really a, a, a demonstration and, and proof to, of, of the API. It wasn't a, a, an actual, you know, really nicely formatted API with graphs and buttons and all that great stuff. It, it was just enough to show that it works and show how, the, how it worked. So the answer is there is no UI. And to be honest, um, I like the back end development. So when there's no UI, I'm really happy. Um, okay. So now we've got all of that in play. We can start to talk about what does this look like? So let um, me back up here. If, if in this diagram, uh, you've got the user and it wants to, well, we just have to do this. We're going to make a call to the, service framework and say, I want to register a new device. Uh, and it's going to go out to the agent and then it's going to talk to that device and, and get some information. Okay. So I just want to know what does it look like when I make that call from the user side to the service frame network, because everything beyond that is really internal processing. And we're really interested in how can we replace this JSON or XML with RDF and how well does that work? So, oops. Go right correction here. So what we want to do is we want to be able to send something that looks like something like what, what I'm showing here in the convert in the conversions for the RDF. Um, we've defined a namespace. The default namespace is the user namespace for the, um, for the user for the whoever's using the system, obviously. And then we have a system namespace for all of the stuff that we're doing internally. And then I've added CPE, which is the common platform enumeration. Uh, so this is, you know, a common naming for all sorts of things. It's used in uh, bug reports and whatnot. So in the example here, um, 
the user saying, I, I want to create, uh, an, I'm going to create an event. I'm going to put this um, request in. I want to create an a device. I'm going to call it my new device. That's, that's my name. That's what I'm going to call it. Um, and I think that it is, um, it has a CPE name of, uh, what is that, 360 FC, F5C router, which is a real live CPE ID name um, and their nomenclature. And um, this, uh, this event that I'm, this coming in was triggered by a thing that I call thing one. And I want to talk to uh, the IP 192.168.13. So that's the data we're trying to look for. Right? That's sort of what we're, we're trying to show uh, in the rest of these uh, examples here. So um, if we were to do this in JSON, to the, the example, the way we did it was we said, all right, in the, we'll put brackets up here. Now this is not, this is not RDF uh, LD. This is not JSON LD. This is not the, the RDF JSON. This is a, a mechanism that we, used to convert from very simple JSON into the, the type of structure that we were looking for like that, where it was very easy for end user developers to be able to come in and, and build, a, uh, build a JSON query, or build a JSON object that they could send that would not, um, they would not have to go out and learn all of the, the RDF stuff. So the, the developer it made it easier for developers to get started in the process. So in this case, define the namespaces inside these square brackets with the at um, namespace kind of notation here. So we define the namespaces and then the, uh, the names of the values then are, have a colon uh, in, the, in the names of the JSON uh, uh, names. And uh, other than that, it's a pretty much a straight structured you know, JSON structure. Um, Okay. So when we looked at it, doing this as a, a name value pairs, uh, if we look at what, uh, what the uh, commons um, configuration did, um, basically this is what the property file would look like for that. So again, it's the same sort of structure with the square brackets defining the namespaces and then uh, properties with the colon uh, separating the values. Now, in the in the um, commons configuration, colon is a, a an acceptable replacement for equals, and so this example shows what you would have to do if you didn't write a, a little bit of a custom code for the uh, commons uh, configuration system. Now you you can tell it. Never mind, the colon is not the same as equals, and then you can get rid of all those escapes on the on the colons in here, but. Uh, so this shows basically what a what a property file would name you know name value pairs or posting from a, a web form might look like. Um, let's see, so our story thus far, we have thing one now out here in user space has submitted the request to the service network. It's gone across the agent processes it. It talks to the device. It gets information back. Puts it back on the queue. Comes back in. Uh, gets stuck up into the, the Jenna Fuseki space there. Um, the user can now come in later and ask questions like, uh, what thing, what did thing one register in the last hour? Because we've got, you know, the event has a time of, uh, associated with it. We know, you know, we can ask what IP addresses were registered. We can ask things like this. We can, which is something, you know, we might not have thought about when we originally wrote the code. Um, we can ask, you know, is, you can ask questions like, you know, is thing one making uh, registrations? Is it, or has it fallen over basically? You can, you can sort of ask that of the, of the data stream. Um, so what we've done is we've effectively replaced the XML and the JSON in the system with RDF and shown that we can move it end to end and the, it, the data is um, very easy to query uh, in, in the, inside the system. Okay, so what are our advantages? Um, we don't have the name collisions, as, as we noted. Um, we have the ability to add data elements, so the user was able to add an element, and that would have flown, gone all the way through the system and been 
with the object in the end. So you can use that as part of their queries to, to determine what they're looking for or to you know, find what they're looking for in, in, the, in the data. Um, we're able to quickly support new user requirements so we can answer questions that we never plan for during the, the analysis. Uh, we can inject additional user information or additional information from other systems into the, uh, into the data stream and process them and be able to query against them. Uh, and we're able to process externally linked data. So for example, the, the CPE data, um, there's a publication that lists, there's a, you know, the, lists all of the CPEs and information about those, each one of those named things, uh, you know, who owns it, what does it mean, what is it, uh, what versions of it are there any, and you can then query that and ask if there are any uh, bugs open against those devices, are there any, you know, uh, reports of, of uh, security issues and things like that. So we're able to now look at what what the devices are saying they are and put that in and then tie that into the CPE and be able to say, oh, um, the user can now come in and say, oh, do we have any devices that have new um, security reports against them? And we can answer that question. Um, and finally, we have this extensible architecture where we're using Kafka to stream the data through. And then because we're using Kafka, we can use all of the Kafka streaming capabilities to look at the data that's that's in the RDF documents as they're streaming through the system and add to that, make it do analysis of that. Um, it takes a little bit more work currently to do that because um, you know most of those processes that the people are writing are looking for for RDF or X or not sorry for JSON or XML. We can convert back to JSON because we've got this. Um, the front end piece that does that, but it's it's often easier to just write uh, small components that plug into the through the Kafka architect uh, networks to be able to parse that data uh, as it's flowing through the system. Okay, so my favorite Casablanca slide is as time goes by. Um, what we found out were that some of these devices have very large configurations on the order of hundreds of megabytes in size. And, and that just seems outrageous to me, but that's what they are. You ask it for, you ask the device for its configuration, hundreds of megabytes come back. Um, Kafka has some upper limits to the size of messages. So we had to develop a technique to split those messages um, and, and then reassemble them. It's not that hard. Uh, there's no priority queue in Kafka. Okay, we can handle that in code. Um, the last one here, the RDF data plus the schema. Now we had a little bit of schema attached to, you know, was this value supposed to only occur once or, you know, did we allow multiples, things like that. Um, we ended up having to, we passed the schema around with the data um, because it's all a graph, right? Um, that gave us large-ish graphs. Uh, and so we, when they got really big, we began to split them up as well. There's, there are probably better solutions to that. And that's one of those things where I, I would have to say, we thought we knew what we were doing and um, it, it came back around to, to be something we didn't know. Um, and, and so that's one of those things uh, we could have handled better. Um, so that's, um, Basically, the end of, uh, comes to the end of the my talk. Um, so let me ask if there are any questions. I'll let you know that, that any of the open source pieces that were developed, uh, I have available on my GitHub. Um, I've got some publications. I don't think there's any specifically on on this package up on uh, research research gate, and um, you can find me on LinkedIn. So uh, let me ask if there are any questions. Well, not yet. I haven't seen it. <laughs> okay. So no, I, I went too don't fast. Think you went too fast. <laughs> I think, I'm thinking, um, okay, yeah, maybe not. So, I think it's about uh, time for the next presentation. About well, five minutes. Okay. Wow. Well, then. Um,
Oh, here's a question. What would be the alternative to RDF? Um, oh, you mean in, in terms of passing back and forth in the um, the biggish con container or biggish graphs? Um, I don't know that we would need to pass the entire graph back and forth. We decided to split the graph. I mean, actually split the message and, and look at the whole graph as a one message and split it up and ship it across and reassemble it on the other side. But realistically, the RDF graph, you can split into two parts and you really have two graphs. You don't have, you know, one, one part, one graph in two pieces that you have to recombine to make work. So we could have shipped this, you could have just, you know, segmented it and shipped the data across the, the network. Um, in a different way, and that probably. Uh, Greg Henley asks, uh, "How does the graph structure help with representing configuration?" Um, there's a couple. Of, there's a couple of things that that happen here. We have, uh, if you think about it, in multiple layers. We were looking at um, initially just how do we keep track of what devices we're tracking and when things occurred on those devices, when did configurations change and things like that. Then as we move forward, we look at the, the device configuration and that's, you know, that's the truth of what that device is doing. And if you can parse that configuration, you can then pull the pieces that are critical to what you want to work on and put those in the graph so you can then query. So we could have parsed that information and actually we had a project to do this, is parse the information and say, um, this is this graph. This node in the network talks to all of these other nodes uh, on you know various um, levels of the the network. Uh, you know, is it is it talking? Is it plugged into something, or is it is it actually just talking across the network? Uh, and you're able to determine that by by actually looking at the configuration file. So the the graph structure there really lets you say, oh yeah, this node thinks it's talking to this other node, and the other node doesn't realize that the, there's nothing in the configuration to say it's talking. Something's talking to it. Um, for example, you might have firewall rules that would come into play, and you'd be able to say, oh, um, this node's trying to talk to that node, but that node has a firewall rule that stops it from happening. Um, so you can do some sorts of uh, work like that to to uh, understand that and you know really the configurations of those devices are talking about what the network mm -hmm. looks like oh. uh, in some respects now some other things mm -hmm. obviously well adina uh, asks uh, you mentioned largish graphs can you comment on how big the rdf data set is in jenna um we ran um it's it's not the it's not the total data set that that were largish in this case the the data set was um, thousands of devices when we got done uh, and many of those had um, well you had devices and then devices would have uh, components that talk to like you know what how did we talk to the device you know did we talk over SSH and what was the configuration so we could go back and, and do that again very quickly but um, so you had thousands of devices and then each of the devices had uh, references to their configurations and how when those were updated and things like that. So the, the graph for a device gets fairly large. When we started talking to those devices and um, we would send data over to the, in, to the agent and the agent would then uh, get a lot of data from the device and if we at one time, we were parsing some of that data on, out on the edge to make some decisions. So we were enhancing the graph. And that graph, along with the schema that talked about what things were supposed to be unique and, and whatnot, got to the point where they were approaching this, the limit, the, the default size for a, yeah. um, for a Kafka message. Ah. And that's what I meant by largest. So those, those are actually, in terms of a graph, okay. they're pretty small. Um, in terms of how big of the data package it is on mm -hmm. on Kafka, that can be fairly large. So it all depends on where I you're see. looking. So how many triples total, and then we have to end it in the data set? Um, 
<laughs> how many? Oh, okay. I don't know how many triples actually okay. were in the data set. Oh, I was just curious. Um, <laughs> it was. I remember that it was large, and um, I was okay. impressed that we actually well, got there. Thank you, uh, and I guess it's time for the next talk. All right. Thank you.